I watch with great interest. Um, Hannah's excellent and extremely detailed. I mean, Hannah is nothing if not thorough. That was a wonderful um, <laughs> well, webinar that you did um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and with Hannah, what we decided to do was just add a little bit more detail um, and, and, and a, a slightly different perspective on thinking about offices. So I come from an office company um, called Ripe Office. We provide sustainable office furniture um, and sustainable offices what we're all about, which of course, um, health and safety around COVID-19 is a big part of that. So um, what we did is we pulled this together as a part two. So um, without any further um, discussion, let's go into um, what's going on in COVID um, in offices. Now what, what Boris um, and, and his senior team have done is they've made the whole response to COVID-19 in terms of offices a health and safety responsibility. Now Hannah spoke about that extensively on the last um, call. Um, what's keen to note then is that that comes with carrots and sticks um, and what the government has said very clearly is that if you have over five staff you must conduct a COVID-19 risk assessment as soon as possible and in consultation with your HSE rep and staff. So it's what, what this is effectively saying is actually the government's not going to dictate what you do for your own office which in a way is a good thing but also a bad thing and there's been a lot of criticism for that. What, what the government has said is actually it's up to you and your health and safety duty of care and responsibilities to make sure that your workplace is, is safe. Um, and what it's cleverly done behind the scenes is come up, and, and, and by the way, that, that sitting on the fence means that actually the government's off the hook because if they said do something and then people died, then everyone would be suing the government for that. Conversely, if they said, um, actually, we don't care, then they would be criticised. So it's sort of a sit on the fence approach for them. And behind the scenes, they've set up these two car the carrot and a stick approach. So from a stick side, I've just mentioned it's a legal obligation and the health and safety executive, executive will be doing the policing of it. But from a carrot side, they've invented this funny little blue and white sign that you can see on the left there. And I saw my first one in an office the other day. And what employers are encouraged to do is once they've met the health and safety risk assessment and address that, they can sign this sign and then put it up on the window to say, hey, this is a safe office or as safe as we possibly can make it because we followed the government's guidelines and done a risk assessment. So what we fully see and, and heartily endorse is the idea of let's get these up as big as we can. So we're going to put up one on our front door actually for visitors to see that's as big as we can blow it up to given our printer capabilities. Um, and what that does is it says, hey, this is a safe space. And that, at the end of the day, is going to be really important um, for both visitors once we invite them back into our, our offices, but more importantly for getting staff back because um, for many workplaces who have started back, we're a manufacturer um, and, and sort of in the construction industry, so we've been back for a couple of weeks now and we found it difficult and, and the employers that we're working with are finding it difficult as well because staff, some staff just don't want to come back to work. And if they don't want to come back to work, their easiest ex excuse is, hey, it's not safe, therefore I'm not going to come in. Um, and that makes it very difficult to get everything back to normal um, and a business running again. So, so this is the government's approach and that um, little blue and white form um, is a really good way to start showing your staff that you're doing things safely. Did you have any comments on that, Hannah? Uh, no, I think that's right. Just We've just got a couple of people letting me know. I've turned my volume right up, but your mic went faint not long after you started talking, so people are finding it a little bit hard to hear. Okay, so I've just lifted that's it up. Better. Is that better? Yeah, that's okay. better. Yeah, yeah, I've got a directional better. mic, which is not great. Um, and also, we had these poll questions set up. Did you want me to shoot those out to everybody now? Yeah, that's a, that's a good yeah? idea. Perfect. So we've just got a couple of questions on a poll. So I'm just going to send that out now. Um, just asking right now, um, is your organisation responding to COVID by... And then some multiple choice questions. So keeping everyone at home, encouraging staff to go into the office or allowing staff to come in if they wish. And then also, what has your organisation done to keep staff safe? So prepared your office with a range of initiatives that follow those guidelines, um, conducted a risk assessment, um, some minor changes or not done anything yet. So some multiple choice questions and I can see everyone voting away. We're about halfway there. And then I'll share the results before we move on. But yeah, I think absolutely it's, um, to be honest, like I said on the webinar the other week, I think that the pack is pretty good uh, that they've prepared. So if you follow that, um, we've got a question, sorry, just come in as well from Carol. The government's document states they would expect all employers with over 50 to publish the risk assessment on their website. Is this for everyone to see or just staff? I would, I would suggest just staff if you can. However, 
they haven't stipulated and the, me the reason they may want you to put it on your main website is so that the HSE can actually see that those larger companies have done it. Um, so that might be why. They actually don't say to publish your risk assessment, they say to publish your findings as well. And I think it's, I think it's important to distinguish between the two. So your findings could actually be um, doing the risk assessment, that's where you need to start for sure, but your findings are actually perhaps developing the policy or your guidance that you would then send to staff off the back of that. So you wouldn't necessarily send to staff the entire risk assessment because it's quite complex, it's not easy to read, it doesn't necessarily give them an easy um, guidance, easy, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Greg, but, you know, it's not like this is what we need you to do. It's not user um, friendly, is it? Yeah, it's, it's not, not, not action fo focused at all, no. Exactly, don't. yeah. So um, there were some emails I, I had from travel companies and things where they've just got like a really simple email of like a three to five step guide on, you know, wear your mask, use contactless tickets or credit cards if you can so you're not touching tickets in and out and, um, you know, all these kind of things to just give that directive to make it clear. So that's what they're expecting to see is, is for you to publish your findings, not necessarily the risk assessment. I personally would not dream of sending a risk assessment, particularly of this um, nature, of this sensitivity where everybody will have an opinion on it and what you're doing because you go into so much detail about risk and therefore what controls you're going to put in place that you may get people coming back and you probably will when you send a policy anyway saying what about this what about that you haven't detailed this risk you haven't I, I just think it opens up a big can of worms so do your risk assessment and then create an easy you know two three four pager at most policy that says this is what we're doing as your employer and this is what we expect you to do as the employees visitors whatever else um, I hope that helps Carol Okay, how are we getting on with the poll? So, uh, most of you have voted 84% now. We've got a couple of minutes left, but we are on. So, right now, my organisation is responding to COVID by keeping everyone at home for the moment, 95%. So, that's wow. really sensible. And I think that shows that there's some good organisations there that, that are doing that. Um, no one is encouraging staff to come to the office so far in the poll. And 9% are allowing staff to come in if they wish to. Wow, okay. Mm. And then the second question we asked about the organisation and what it's done. Um, so 26% have prepared for um, initiatives, follow the guide guidelines. 43% uh, have prepared a, a risk of, uh, or conducted risk assessment and are yet to implement the findings, which is, which is good that you've, you've done that. 13% um, have made some minor changes and 35% haven't done anything as yet. What do you think about that, Greg? Yeah, I, th none of that surprises me. I mean, probably, if I reflect on both of those responses, both the questions, the first one, 95% keeping everyone at home, means we have the bulk of our work ahead of us as responsible parties, and that's everyone on this call, because otherwise you wouldn't be on it. Um, we have a lot of work ahead of us to get our offices ready, because mm -hmm. most people aren't in the office just yet. Um, however, I mean, on question two, um, great that 26% are following the guidelines, um, and I would hope that after this, um, everyone has a slightly clearer view of that and can access those a little easier. 43% um, conducted risk assessment, that's way beyond my expectations, and I think hats off to everyone on the call, because obviously you're, you're, you've probably done it, right? I mean, the, the people on this call are the people who take responsibility for these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, and 35% not done, well, that, that really shouldn't surprise us, given that 95% of organisations aren't back to work yet. So no. I, I, I think for those 35%, the work is ahead of them big time because you then have to do the risk assessment and then after the risk assessment obviously carry out the actions. Um, however, the fact that 43% have done the risk assessment but haven't um, implemented yet um, also says that there's more work to do around actions. So I, I think the content of what we what we say now um, going forwards on this presentation, I think we'll, we'll um, slightly tailor it but I think broadly we're in the right direction and staying on staying as staying as listening of uh, to, to what we've got to say is probably relevant to just about everyone on the call then which is yeah. which is good news I think and um, we've had a couple of other questions just to us so um one person's asked if you've got a bigger picture of the parrot I don't think you've got it in the slides it's just that obviously we can't see the bullets of the five steps very clearly um, but we can send the link to that or we can send the actual 
Yeah. There's, there's one at the back of the presentation, you'll remember. Perfect. Um, yeah. so, so it's in the resources at the back of this, so you can go and uh, click on that. Yeah, so hopefully that helps. Um, and then someone else has asked how many people took part in the poll. Uh, 24. Okay. Okay, thanks, cool. Greg. All right, so should we continue? Would, would yes, you mind please. taking the poll down off the screen? How can, oh, yeah, I can do that. No, I've taken that down. So the, the, what, we've, what, what we've now done is, is sort of have, having recognised as a risk assessment, key question is, well, what are the sort of topics that you would look at in a risk assessment? Um, and, and for that, we've got a very simple answer, and that is um, a framework that we call the 4H frameworks. I'm just trying to get to it. My page is frozen at the moment. How do I get my page down? There we go. Here's the 4-H framework. Um, number one is hygiene. So thinking about all the basic hygiene stuff. And we'll go into these in a little bit more detail. And of course, um, Hannah will make this whole presentation available to you have it, so you have it as a resource. Um, the second one is hours. So thinking about who comes in when. Um, the third one is horizontal distance or social distancing as it's known. Um, and the fourth one is home working, which is going to be a big way, a big part of our future new normal. Um, like it or not, uh, there are many, many commuters who are just, have realised now how awful their commute is and how they don't want to do it again, especially on crowded trains. So it may be that many people are taking up agile working on a more permanent basis. So let's go into those really quickly in a bit more detail. So on the hygiene stuff, we've, we've separated this into the obvious stuff, which everyone knows about. I won't go into those. Um, and then the not so obvious. So things like um, increasing air exchange rates um, in air conditioning systems and opening windows, that's encouraged by the government and a good idea. Um, what the scientists are saying is that fresh air seems to be a uh, an enemy of COVID-19, so why not encourage the use of fresh air? Um, second, second, not so obvious, is checking staff temperatures as they arrive at work. Um, I was a little bit concerned that that might seem a little bit um, big brother, uh, and we saw lots of photos early on uh, as Wuhan came out of its lockdown of, of people having their temperature checked. But actually, it seems like it's becoming regular practice now and a part of the standard response. Um, and the great thing about recording temperatures when they come in, when people come into the workplace, is you can actually track who, those who, who have a high temperature um, and help the government program. But most importantly, you can turn people away um, at the front door before they infect your safe zone, um, which is the workplace. And, and, but obviously turning people away isn't as easy as just saying, oh, I'm sorry, um, Bill, you can't come in today because you've got a high temperature. What you actually need to back that up is some protocols um, that have been signed off by senior management with a clear um, work plan that HR is happy with so that actually there's a really clear process to follow that's been signed off that everyone agrees um, and that gets rid of Bill then saying oh look hang on I just want to come in and pick something up or I refuse to go, go back home because I've just done a long trip into work etc etc it actually just makes that decision making a whole lot easier and takes the guilt off anyone who's who's got that unfortunate role of turning someone away because they have a high temperature so that's the sort of point one is hygiene. Moving on to point two, um, the hours. And there's really only two sort of sub points here. One is that um, organisations are staggering their start times uh, and their break times to minimise congestion. And obviously, if you start early, you'll want an earlier lunch and an earlier cup of tea. So that actually means that all of your congestion at the front door in the case of people coming and going um, and in the, around the coffee machine at break times um, and whilst we hear that canteens are being shut down, there's still going to be pinch points around um, food management at lunchtime, for instance. The second and more extreme version of that is shifts. Uh, and we're seeing some organisations moving to shifts um, and some actually opening up their offices as, let's, let's say, sort of drop-in spaces for weekends um, when someone wants to come in and, and photocopy a document or catch up on something or um, have, have an informal meeting with someone, then why, why not open your office over the weekend so that people can do that? And that then just staggers, spreads out the staff load um, even greater. Um, and the key thing, of course, when thinking about staggering hours is not just uh, congestion within the office. It's also uh, public transport uh, and roads because whilst most governments are doing a great job to increase the number of cycling lanes and encourage people to walk and the weather's been fantastic, um, it's also pushing people more onto the road uh, and public transport is about what, 13 to 30, depending on who you're talking about, um, percent of its normal load uh, capacity. So that means public transport's more difficult. And of course, no one wants to sit on a very crowded 
uh, platform with a whole bunch of other people who may or may not have uh, COVID-19. So all things to think about. And in fact, whilst we're on the subject of transport, what we're finding is that for many organisations, getting people to and from work safely, especially in an environment like um, a central city uh, where public transport's traditionally been relied upon, that can actually be the big turnoff point for staff. Whilst they, you might have created a wonderful safe zone at work, convincing people to catch public transports or, or helping them to get to work safely is quite difficult. We've heard stories of uh, organisations hiring cars for people um, if they're high risk um, in order to help them um, and all sorts of stuff like that. Can so that's the second H, that's the hours. And the third one is horizontal separation. And we're seeing lots of really interesting innovation, especially in office design. Um, the number one thing that will help horizontal separation is having only a proportion of people back in the office. So not inviting everyone back, but something like 40 to 50%. Um, amongst the organisations we've been helping and dealing with, um, the, the sort of universal rule of thumb seems to be between 40 and 50 percent of staff back in the office partly because the remainder of some of them don't want to come back to work some of them are quite happy working from home some of them don't need to be in the office um, and, and some of them um, they, they've figured out alternative working arrangements so having a percentage of the staff back in the office is the easy way to firstly cut down your load and ensure that within an office footprint um, you can have people socially distancing um, things like using every second desk, turning desks to face the walls instead of each other where people can sneeze over each other. Um, using meeting rooms may not be instinctively obvious, but if you're not having any meetings with no visitors at the moment, then meeting rooms can certainly be used as offices um, and that will space people out. Um, kitchens and canteens and breakout areas, making sure that um, things are spaced out there. We're seeing clients removing every second or, th or, or two of three chairs in a canteen. Um, to try and enforce that, stacking them up, locking them in the storeroom uh, and, and putting the key away where no one can find it. Um, Counterintuitive things like uh, encouraging staff to eat at their desk, establishing one-way routes, um, especially with floor arrows, uh, visual separation cues are, uh, are appearing everywhere uh, and so why not put them in the office as well. Um, encouraging use of stairs and things like fire exits, right? I mean, if you've got a lift, um, everyone's going to want to use the lift um, and that's an obvious congestion point. Whereas if you have perfectly serviceable, um, having a one-way system that goes out through that um, can be arranged as well in some instances. So that's sort of a, a broad sort of overview of the sort of horizontal separation. Some of the interesting things there, um, we're happy to help out. If anyone's got an office with 20 people or more, uh, we're happy to help out with some free advice on sort of how to redesign an office space. Um, that's something we do as a company. Um, and I thought I'd show you some photos, right? It gets a bit boring if it's all words. So here's some interesting carpet tiles that Interface have developed um, that you can drop in that have the arrows not just painted on, but actually woven into the carpet tile. Um, and what a clever idea. If you have carpet tiles, pull up one in every five along a row, put down one of these, and at the end of the COVID-19 problem, um, we can just pull them up again and put the old carpet tiles back and you've not actually created any damage on your flooring. A very, very simple solution to do. Um, and some of them can look quite attractive. So I've got a couple of photos here. What a, what a really, um, this, this slide shows a really sort of non-invasive, not particularly ugly, quite well curated approach um, to putting arrows on floors. Um, and, and that can be done with sort of bigger arrows if you need. Uh, and then for those pinch areas or the, the danger areas, this idea of using carpet tiles um, to create sort of horizontal or diagonal stripes on an area so that people realize that this is a danger zone, they should clear as quickly as possible or wait until people have come out of the lift before they step into that zone. So that's just another example of how you can use your current environment with some simple modifications to create a space that's still attractive, but does get the message across through the, uh, the imagery that you're using on the floors. Fourth um, and final H that we ask that we suggest to people to include in your risk assessment um, is home working. Um, this is no question the best way to shield staff, uh, and it means that, as we talked about before, in terms of horizontal separation, it means fewer staff in the office um, means you can use that space for others. Um, we are uh, sorry. Ergonomically, the evidence um, is very clear that your staff will work a lot more productively and comfortably if they have really just two things as a minimum. One is an adjustable chair with arms so that all of the right bits of the back can be supported and the shoulders. Um, and secondly, a screen height just below eye level. 
Now, if you've been working on a, let's say for instance, working off a laptop, sitting on your child's cot, um, and you would be surprised how many Zoom meetings I've had where you've got um, stars and moons um, floating from a, um, a, a suspension device in a child, what's clearly a child's room. Um, so people are clearly working in children's bedrooms. That's not a problem in itself, except if your posture is poor. Uh, and that's leading to discomfort. And frankly, that will lead to all sorts of productivity problems down the road and potentially health issues as well. Um, and what we're finding is that many organisations are happy to pay for home office furniture because firstly, it's an HSE obligation. If you look up the rules um, of health and safety in the UK, if someone is working from home for a long period, it is the obligation of the organisation to provide them with, with furniture that's looking after their health and safety, in this case, ergonomics. Um, it also improves productivity and improves resilience. I mean, one of the things that few companies are thinking about is, well, what happens if there's a second wave that means we go into lockdown at very short notice? As soon as that happens, it will be very difficult to get quality home furniture into people's homes because everything will shut down. So acting sooner rather than later to make sure everyone has furniture in their homes is a smart thing to do. Now, this doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money. And what we're seeing is some organisations are saying, well, if 50% of our staff are going to come back, um, that means we've got 50% of our chairs and our monitor screens that we can easily make sure um, we distribute to our staff. So staff are actually sitting on at home, their old chair that they were sitting on um, in the office. Um, and some companies have been organised enough to have them couriered out um, or use a service to get them out. So that's, that's a really low cost solution that you might like to think about uh, in your risk planning. Uh, and what you do as an action there. So I think we've gone through pretty quickly the four H's there. Um, wanted to remember that there are four things, three other C's, let's call them the three C's, um, to remember when we're thinking about this risk assessment. So number one is comfort. Uh, what we don't want to do is, is do things that make the office less, less comfortable um, or home working less comfortable. Um, secondly, climate change. Uh, let's recognise that sustainability is still a big thing. Um, we are at the start of an act, a, a decade of action on cli the climate emergency. That hasn't changed. Um, and most of our organisations have signed um, commitments to make sure that we continue to do that. And of course, as you will know, there's always a cost um, aspect to any change. Um, and of course, companies are trying to minimise that, especially when um, hopefully in three to six months time, all lockdowns will have been lifted um, and social distancing will have been removed. Fingers crossed, that means we can go back to work as normal. What you don't want to do is set up very expensive acrylic screens, which right now I see that the lead time for is at least six weeks. You spend a lot of money on that and then they end up on a landfill somewhere because no one wants acrylic screens um, in, in six months time. And, and by the way, the government's really not a fan of acrylic screens. Their view is it's the two metre social distance that's the most important thing and screens are just a shortcut um, that can actually lead to more problems putting them in um, than not. On the subject of uh, climate change uh, and the environment, um, one of the things um, that's not widely recognised is the importance of furniture um, in, the, in a building's footprint. So this, is, this pie chart here shows all of the embodied greenhouse gas emissions, that's carbon, that's embodied in a commercial building over its entire life, right the way from the hole that's ground, that dug in the ground, um, the foundations that go in, the columns, the beams, the floor plates, the glass walls, the roof, right through to, fur to furniture, furnishings, electrical, et cetera, et cetera, and operating energy at the end of the day. Um, a lot of people are worried about coffee cups in offices and the greenhouse gas and environmental impact of those. They are a very small part of the other 6% there actually furniture because furniture is on average changed every six years or so and that most of that ends up in landfill the greenhouse gas emissions from furniture over the lifetime of the building because it's been changed so often are around uh, 30 percent that's almost a third of the entire greenhouse footprint of a building so think very hard about furniture we are in the furniture remanufacturing game um, we actually have a circular furniture business model because we think that is a figure that should come down in order to, to protect the planet, but with no loss of the quality of furniture. Um, and in fact, um, remanufacturing can lead to an 80% reduction in that furniture footprint. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I thought, I, given I've mentioned remanufacturing a couple of times in this presentation, I thought it'd be rude to not really explain what that is. And that's about starting with a beautiful design for an office, sourcing furniture from existing furniture, used furniture, surplus stock, 
um, and then remanufacturing it, which is an engineering process. I'm an engineer by training, so we've got an engineering process to bring furniture back to as new condition, which we do locally. Um, and then once we install that furniture with a customer, uh, we guarantee to take that back because we wouldn't be a circular furniture company if we didn't take it back. We would just be another linear furniture company. So that's sort of just a, a, an introduction to remanufacturing. And what we're finding is that we've got lots and lots of customers right now um, who are interested in purchasing furniture for staff homes um, because it is better value for money, it's super sustainable um, and, and it can be remanufactured. So it's quite a good solution um, that's environmentally friendly um, in order to, to have people at home on more comfortable furniture and for that matter electronics because our sister company remanufactures office electronics and IT equipment. Um, and, and then the other point, of course, around remanufacturing is that remanufactured furniture is the best value for money. Here, for instance, is a list price of a, of a desk chair. Um, you might be able to bargain that down um, a few hundred quid, but you'll never get anywhere near a grade A remanufactured piece that we sell um, just because our, our stru the structural cost of remanufacturing is much, much less. So in summary then, um, we've talked about when you're doing a risk assessment, broadly thinking about four different H's. They are hygiene, hours, horizontal distance, um, and home working. And we've also provided some resources here. So um, there is um, our free design service, which I talked about. Here's my email, so happy to hear from you if you're interested in that. Uh, we've written a blog that covers some of the points raised on this, uh, on this webinar, uh, which you can access there. Um, we've also included a blog um, on five tips for home office productivity, which is about how to cost effectively improve ho home office uh, ergonomics uh, and talks about how to set up monitors, et cetera, et cetera. There's a link there to the UK government guidelines. Um, and as you go through that, you'll find where to download that uh, blue and white uh, poster. Um, and of course, the office management portal has lots of good information on it as well. So hopefully that's been handy. Um, please feel free to reach out. Um, Hannah. Um, back to you. Uh, love to hear some questions from the group. Yeah, definitely. If anyone's got any questions for Greg or I, please do let us know. I'll share the results of the poll with everybody now just so that um, you can see those on your screens as well, if that helps. Um, thank you so much, Greg. I think that was really useful. And I think really, you know, it's only been a couple of weeks since we did the first session of returning to work. And not too much has changed in that time, but I think we'll keep doing these so that we keep having these open discussions, um, you know, learning as we go. The carpet tiles is something that I hadn't seen yet, and I think that's a really good idea so that you're not putting signage all over the place that, um, you know, with those carpet tiles, you can reuse them as well. You can put them in your stock room, and, um, you know, if this happens again, People are saying pandemics, this won't be the last one we'll see, certainly in our, our generation. Um, you can keep them in the stock room and um, hopefully reuse them. So that's really good. And it's definitely of interest to look at the sustainable side of this and what we're doing and just have that in the back of our minds. You know, I've walked down the streets many times, walking the dog and the baby and things and seen masks just everywhere on the floor and bottles of hand sanitizer and things just, you know, and it's and it's so upsetting that even in a pandemic, humans can't continue to take care of the planet. So if you have an influence in any way in what your office does during this time, and once you open back up, do keep the environment in mind if you can, and um, the way that you do dispose of things if you do decide to get screens and things in place, um, because you know it does, it does impact us all long term and, and things like that are there forever. So it's been, re been really interesting to have that take on it. So any questions for anybody? Does anyone want to raise their hand um, and ask any questions? Feel free to do it in the chat. Uh, okay, so we've had one in so far. What office tools would you recommend for facilities and administration team to use? Um, in, in what regard do you mean there? Are you able to, to open up a little bit more? Do you mean tools in relation to, to supporting with this particular task in terms of doing the risk assessment or do you mean in general that's from Davika so let us know there Davika um, and we can try and answer that unless Greg you know perhaps well I, I, I think the number one tool is is the wonderful risk assessment matrix that you've mm -hmm. um, provided Hannah 
Um, and we, our company, we, we have started on, we, we, for our risk assessment, what we did is we took our normal HSE risk assessment um, and they did a COVID-19 special of that, mm. really. And, and for us, keeping them separate is quite useful. So we've got the one that we do every year and now one that we may or may not visit, revisit in 12 months' time, which we can file away forever if we don't need it again. Or if we do, we've always got it and we can take it out. Um, and what we didn't want to do was, was pollute the regular health and safety assessment with some issues that are really quite time-bounded hopefully mm. time bounded uh, and, and just separating the two made it really easy and that makes it easier to focus the whole team um, when we share that with our staff um, on the COVID issue rather than dealing with everything else that we might have to worry about in terms of stairs slips and trips and all that other stuff which we normally cover off yeah absolutely and yeah it was um was the risk assessment so um so in terms of tools that my my advice would be to yeah like greg said take your current office risk assessment and take it back to almost bare bones. So look at all the hazards that you've got on there and then consider whether anything to do with coronavirus will impact those and, and add um, your mitigating actions to that. So take, for example, if you've got travel as one in there, what actions will you do? Will you ban travel for the time being? And I'm not necessarily meaning just international. I mean, traveling to and from meetings in work hours, um, you know, stress, that's one that you need to consider because, and hopefully it will be on your existing risk assessment, but because you've got people working from home, you can't reach out to them as easily as you can when they're in the office. So monitoring that. So taking your existing risk assessment is, is the best way to start. And then, um, yeah, saving a completely different version down or adding a COVID section to it. There is a template available within the office management portal. It's just £10. So for anyone that's already a member, hopefully you've seen our comms on that and you can download that for just £10 or for free if you're an enhanced member. And if you're not yet a member of the portal, as Greg showed on the previous slide, the link is in there. And we've also added some action plans and policies as well that you can download. Um, so that may help you to, to make a start. It's about an eight page document that we've done just trying to cover all bases. Um, but my best advice is to go into your office, make sure no one else is there and spend a good, depending on the size of it, obviously if you've got you know, a, a 10 person office, you're not gonna be there for too long. But go in and spend some time there on your own and just walk around, take your time and think about when people are back here. What are they going to be doing? You know, one of the things I mentioned um, in a previous webinar and, or in a q and I did recently on Instagram live was, you know, reception suites. Do you have suites like a lot of people do in a bowl at your reception desk? You know, just look for things like that because that hopefully you take it away quite quickly, but things like that might be missed and they're, they're high touch points, they're temptation points. So um, remove all that kind of stuff. Um, and go around and make notes on a piece of paper, on an iPad, whatever, of everything that you need to take into consideration and then go and sit at your desk and work through those hazards and work through how you would try and um, reduce them or remove them altogether, which is, which is the aim. So some of the advice Greg's given already about, you know, the shift um, hours and splitting when people come into the office. Can you open up on a Saturday? Is anyone able to work over the weekend and swap it for their weekdays? Um, all that sort of stuff you need to take into consideration. Yeah, and, and I think building on that, I mean, each of us have our own pet hates in our offices. This is an opportunity to have some of those grumbles we have about the way the office is inefficiently used. Mm. But this is your chance to get those out there right now, because what we're finding is that senior management teams are very happy to invest to get people back to work because they're desperate for the safe for the for the security of their businesses right and businesses depend on having people able to work effectively so there are small budgets not endless budgets for this um, and so here's a chance to address some of those concerns and pet hates you've had i i, I think you're absolutely right um, in terms of your thinking there hannah so magazine racks Get rid of all those, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I hate the look of magazine racks. They ruin the aesthetic mm -hmm. of, of an entry. But the, often the marketing person says, oh, I've got to have the latest version of our magazine out. Well, no, not anymore. Get rid of those mm -hmm. because they're, they're just germ magnets, right? Yeah. So I, I think thinking, doing that walkthrough and thinking, okay, I've got one bin, one recycling bin here in the middle of the room for everyone. That's going to pull people in together all the time, right? So we don't want that. So get a few more recycling bins and, and distribute them around the office. Really basic thinking like that. Take your time mm -hmm. and, and if, if there is something that's a serious action that you need to take don't be afraid to get a proper budget for that 
um, doing stuff on the cheap. No one's going to thank you if they if they die of COVID nineteen or their their grandfather does because they came into the office and you cut some corners. And and that's not you only your responsibility that's because this is a health and safety responsibility it's your director's responsibility as well so it's a serious thing as hannah says take your time do it properly put some proper budgets to think come up with some interesting ideas um, and i think you'll find that the offer shapes itself quite differently uh, and you'll have a lot of people thanking you for creating a safe environment so we've got some more questions coming in now and um, so one person francisca has asked about plant and um, I, I mean, a lot of people's plants will have died, no doubt, during this time if you haven't allowed your maintenance guys in to water them. I've been speaking to some of our plant companies that we know, and a number of them are um, will have will have inevitably died. I, I don't think it's a problem to keep them. It's not something I, I believe people are touching um, or shouldn't be. But again, it's something to consider in terms of you know if. I mean, they shouldn't be in walkways anyway. They should they should be out of the way. But it's something probably to take into account when you're looking at your space planning and whether they're positioned in places that actually could be an area for somebody to to wait while someone else walks past and things like that. Um, yeah, I, I I don't I don't think they're an issue. Um, it's you're probably asking more so about the maintenance of them and letting people back in, and you need to consider whether that's a necessity. So taking, for example, your air conditioning and your fire alarms and smoke alarms and things like that, someone will have to come into your office and maintain them. Um, before you open up, you should get all that sort of stuff checked and serviced if it hasn't been for a while and if it's out of compliance in that regard. But ongoing, you will need to have people going in there and doing that. And much like splitting people's shifts and staggering their start and end times, you um, you should really try and push all your maintenance people, aircon, changing light bulbs, all this kind of thing to out of hours. So if you haven't done already, start speaking to your maintenance company, your maintenance handyman, whoever it is, and ask them whether they will work out of hours pre 7 a.m. if you're going to start letting people into the office at 7 uh, or, or after, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, weekends only, whatever it might be, um, to, to maintain them. So I would take into consideration whether having those people coming into your office is a risk that you could do without and whether plants are, are necessary at this time. Obviously, they, they have a lot of benefits, so it's, it's weighing that up against the risk of letting people in and maintaining them. Uh, yeah. Davika's asked some, some really interesting questions there that yeah. I'd like to have a crack at answering. So sure. um, number one, uh, so your question, Davika, the question is, um, do we, since we don't have vaccines, what about pesticides and other therapies available in the market? Um, the key thing to remember in this is that um, to date, COVID-19 is not an airborne disease. That is, its particles don't sit in the atmosphere um, by themselves they are transmitted on droplets of moisture that come out of our mouths through speaking coughing sneezing uh, and breathing uh, which is why the two meters is important so the key thing to remember is that once those particles of water or molecules of water are out of our mouths with hopefully not very many but sometimes with COVID-19 germs on them if someone's infected the important thing to remember is that they will then sit on surfaces and so the hygiene regime needs to include cleaners very frequently wiping surfaces with disinfectant and those surfaces i mean you're right frid davika has raised a point about fridges for example in her second question exactly right if people are touching the fridge handle every two minutes there needs to be some really good maintenance of the cleanliness of that fridge handle handle no question um, and things like so for instance if you're doing a shift system and you're hot desking then having a, th a completely clean desk and everything sanitised on that desk before um, the next shift comes in is absolutely vital. Now, the government's suggesting not sharing desks at all, which is not a bad idea, but unfortunately a luxury most of us can't afford. But if you are sharing anything or having something touched on a frequent basis, getting rid of those touch points is important. So, for instance, if you've got a sign-in book, 
um, having people touch the pen one after the other as they're coming into the office before they've washed their hands is a really, really bad idea. So can you move to a, a photo-based recognition system or something um, that's a bit simpler than people touching pens is going to be really important. Uh, and mm -hmm. thinking about yeah. coffee machines, for instance, everyone's going to touch the coffee machine. So a couple of solutions for that, get a couple more coffee machines or put down some hygiene regulations that say, right, if you're going to touch the coffee machine, you've got to wipe it down before use. Think about your gym equipment. Um, last time I was in a gym, which was just before the start of the lockdown, um, there were um, sanitary wipes and, and, encourage, and, and spray bottles, and everyone was encouraged to wipe, their, wipe down their machinery. This is a new normal that we're entering. People really are going to face a whole bunch of changes in the workforce. So if one of those is, hey, we want everyone to use the coffee machine and stay safe, you have to wipe it down after you've used it or before you use it or both. That's actually not a bad outcome, really. And I think people will think very differently when you put up some signs saying, hey, have you thought about, and there's a pack of wipes, no excuse, um, let's mm -hmm. get on with it. Yeah, and I think that's really important. That was one of the questions actually that was asked um, on the portal last week about the coffee machine and whether anyone's got any ideas about that. You know, can you can you enforce that staff don't drink it and bring their own coffee in? And again, that's that's up to you. And, and that's why this risk assessment is so important is thinking about all these, you know, these everyday things. And we've got another question here from Zara about cutlery. Um, I think with the coffee machines, that's a good good point and I think the most sensible thing is yeah have the hand gel hand sanitizer right next to it wipes um, I, I saw someone has managed to get an app and um, so it might be available with your machine so so check with your your contracts but they've managed to get an app where people can order it um, directly from their phone and then they just place the cup in the machine without having to touch the machine at all and it gives them their coffee so they take it away so they're not actually touching anything communal in that case well, she says, and then realises thinking about it that you would probably still open the cupboard door. So, you know, I think it's just making sure you've got plenty of, of wipes and sanitizer because you, unless you have got the budget, you can't have a cleaner clean everything all the time, all day long. It's just not possible. So you've got to make staff accountable for their own health and safety and that of others, which is the law anyway in normal practice. So putting up, you know, red signs that say stop, wipe this before and after use. And those kind of, you know, your brain ticks, like the red alert signs up around things like that, I think will really be effective. Um, cutlery, yeah, I haven't thought of that one. So it's a really good point, Zah. And I think it's something again you need to consider. So, you know, if, if it's out and, and you can put it out on the surface instead of having it in the drawer, that will probably help with one touch point there. But obviously you then have got, you know, when you grab cutlery from those trays, you're probably touching other stuff. So I think it's a case of, um, I don't know, issuing, issuing it to everybody on their desk each morning that they're coming in. Um, so if you've got 40 people in the office that day out of 80 that you might have normally, do you get the cleaner or the office manager or whoever to go around with gloves, clean hands before and after, and literally put, you know, a couple of forks, a couple of knives on the desk um, at the start of each day, and they leave it there on their desk for the day, and then they take it away at the end of the day, or, you know, can you get them to put it in the dishwasher and wash hands before and after use? Um, I think bringing in their own um, would be difficult, um, but yeah, maybe giving it to them, and then, you know, at the start of each day, and they have to, they have to put it back in the dishwasher or leave it on their desk. Be keen to see what anyone else thinks about that one. Um, okay, then we've got a couple more. So, Davika, you said there will be a great challenge with facility management staff to keep to keep clean and hygienic. Yeah, you agree with us. So, yeah. Um, and and one thing I I don't think I've covered yet. When you are asking about the risk assessment, and if you haven't done it yet, I I encourage everybody to do it. Is contact your building management whoever it is, um, contact them and say, hey, can I have your COVID-19 risk assessment? You're getting a jump start then on what they're doing. They're in the same building as you. If the toilets are communal, you'll, you know, you'll know how they're taking care of that. The entrances are probably communal, the barriers are communal, all these kind of things. You'll start to build a picture of how they're taking care of the risks in these communal areas. And then you can bounce off that to do your own risk assessment. So, if you haven't asked for theirs, do. And even if you have, 
um, make sure you review it and you incorporate that into your own or you, you append it to your own risk assessment because it's all part of the same risks you need to make sure you're aware of and managing. Um, let's have a look. Nikki, could you allocate each staff cut member cutlery? Yeah, absolutely. I, in terms of their responsibility for maintaining, I think you may struggle there a little bit unless you, you know, you have a sink that or a few sinks that everybody can access to wash it up. But then you've probably got the issue where even if you stagger breaks at the end of the day um, and stagger shifts, you've, you'll still have a back a sort of queue potentially of people wanting to watch. All of this obviously depends on the size and the facilities available in your office. But just thinking about some that I've been in before, even with a kitchen on each floor, you'd have a queue of people probably trying to watch up. So it's that wonderful blessing like Greg just sort of leaned on where you can hopefully in this time train people to get them to put their stuff in the dishwasher for you. Um, Shardy's put, what are thoughts on those who may cycle in? Normally staff bikes are stored out uh, inside, but would you class that as unsafe, not clean? If so, surely outside is as much of a hazard. I think again, it's about making um, things available, right, Greg? So you know, if they're wheeling staff in, uh, sorry, if they're wheeling bikes in, not staff, if they're wheeling bikes into a communal storage room, it's about making sure that they wash their hands as soon as they've finished. And ideally, you have some wipes or hand sanitizer at the door before you know you can get things. Um, that are stood up on these um, hand sanitizer stands or, or stuck to the wall and so on. So you make sure that you've got enough points around if there isn't a sink available nearby that they can still do that and they just wash their hands or hand sanitize before and after touching the, the um, door handles and, and what not to get in there. Um, can I, sorry, can I interrupt on the, on the subject of cycles? I mean, this, this is a really interesting example of how, just how our offices could well change. Um, so imagine if um, staff are struggling to get into work because they're nervous about um, public transport um, and in a city they won't have a car and they'd be silly to drive into, the, into a city where there's no parking. Um, cycles could be a really important part of getting people back to work. And, and to be clear, what we suggest might happen is that actually staff are very difficult to get back working again. Mm. Um, even some of our best team members who are very, very good workers um, even they said to us, oh, well, do I really have to come back? Well, can't someone else do my work? So it may be very difficult to get people back from this extended um, furlough uh, situation. So it may be that you turn over your front meeting room into a bike storage room. Why not do that, right? I mean, it's going to, it, that would be a really interesting symbol for staff coming back. The first thing they see is a bike room where the big conference room used to be. That says something different. That says, we have changed the way this oper office operates and you have to stand up and take notice because we care about you. Please ride your bike to work because that's a good thing for you, good for the environment um, and good for your health. And of course, good for us because you're back in the office working with us. So mm -hmm. don't be afraid of things that look quite radical because sending big messages through radical solutions is not a bad idea at this time because a, a little sign that says wash your hands a little bit more probably is not going to really be noticed unless it's surrounded by other things like arrows on the floor, new bike area new big signs around coffee machines additional bits of equipment and and desks taped off or, or chairs removed in order that desks can't be used um, that are too close to each other so this is a, let's not underestimate this is a big structural infrastructure change for officers and it's really important if we're going to get staff back to work yeah and just just to make one last point on yours is you know once you've done your your risk assessment and your policy and you've you've said these are these are the rules if you like for, for ease um, if anybody contravenes those, particularly intentionally, they can be, um, you know, just as liable as, as your directors for, um, for deaths, for illnesses relating to this or anything in, in terms of health and safety. So if you have specifically said you need to do this, you need to do that, and people don't do it because they're just being ignorant and they just can't be bothered rather than they, they genuinely forgot that one time um, to wash their hands or to use the wipes or whatever it might be, then um, you know you, you can take them through a disciplinary. Your, you, your company will be able to do that. So that's something to gently remind your staff of, that it's just as much their responsibility as it is yours in, in these situations. Um, there's, there's two. While we're on the subject of bikes, uh, Francesca uh, has raised two really good questions yeah. about landlords. 
I think this is the chance to raise that with landlords. It would be a very foolish landlord that said, oh no, people can't bring, can't park their bikes or bring their bikes in. Yeah. I think that's going to change. So I think there's an opportunity to actually do something good for staff that they'll thank you for. Yeah, um, they're going to have to be much more flexible for sure. Um, there, there's, a, there's a wonderful question um, from Davika on staff morale. So if we can't have office parties um, very easily, and if only senior management go onto the virtual drinking webinars, yet yeah, some of those become a bit blokey. I've, I've, uh, our office has got one as well. It's all uh, blokey blokes drinking beer. Um, how do you keep morale up? So I, this, is, this is a fascinating subject. I mean, I, if staff morale is genuinely a problem, um, it may be worth doing some really interesting things. Like why not have, why not send everyone a beverage and obviously not everyone drinks alcohol, but send them a beverage of their choice um, and arrange for everyone to have a virtual party, a virtual DJ with some head, with your headphones on, you can dance in the, it, dance in the, in your home. I mean, there's all sorts of, your imagination is the limit for when it comes to keeping morale up, but we've seen some really interesting things. Um, dance parties for those of you who aren't fam familiar with morning Gloryville. Um, that's a, that's a network that actually every Saturday at 11 AM has a par dance party and a, and a, yo and a yoga and um, meditation session. Um, which is keeping a lot of mental health um, problems at bay for those who attend. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff. Um, and let's also, when we're on the subject of health, address the pregnancy question. Mm. This is a more serious issue, which is when should someone come to work and what's, what if they can't come to work and can't do their job at home? I, I think absolutely if someone's pregnant or otherwise vulnerable, and there's, I saw, saw the statistics last night, a staggering 2.5 million people are seen as highly vulnerable and have been contacted by the NHS. So some, some people on this call may well be in that category. Um, I think if you can do your work at home, then fine, stay at home. That's absolutely the safest thing to do. Um, and you'll be doing all of your colleagues a favour as well because they won't be worrying so much about you uh, in the office. However, there's some people that can't do their work from home um, that are in the high risk category. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts as to what that means. My understanding from the government guidelines is they're um, able to claim SSP, statutory sick pay. But as we all know, that's about 95 pounds a week, which is not gonna keep anyone alive living in central London or in fact, anywhere in the UK. So I, I don't know what employers are doing about that. I'd love to hear people's views on what that means. Does that mean that person, has to live off statutory sick pay do they are they taking holidays um or are they going to leave the company i don't know mm. i think claire to, to give my my hat on that and having you know i've got a 11 month old um and you know if i was thinking you know i was heavily pregnant this time last year basically and if i were um going through this now or going through the pregnancy now i would really want to keep myself and my baby safe and i think you know, the message is very clear from the government that still, e even now, if you can work from home, do. Um, and I think that's even more, the ca more so the case for people who are pregnant and more vulnerable. So it's absolutely fine. I don't think you're overreacting at all. Um, I would do it in consultation with her. So perhaps you or HR have the discussion to check and see if that's her agreement as well, or if she wants to perhaps come, come in, um, you know, one day a week or whatever, but making sure that she really is taken care of in terms of social distancing and you, you've got the office ready and the office has been through a good few dry runs or practice tests before you go live and certainly before she comes into the office to make sure that it's it's in a good flow and um, before she comes back and and um you know perhaps things aren't quite quite perfect yet in terms of managing or going back so if she does want to go back that's that's entirely her her choice and you may decide to say no, which is also entirely your choice um, and have that discussion with her in consultation. Um, but ultimately no one can force anybody at the moment to come back. If you don't feel safe as an employee going back to work, um, particularly if you have to use the track, if you have to use the underground. So I work part-time um, in, in Mayfair and I live in, in South End in Essex, and I have to get on um, an overground train, it's about an hour's journey, and then I have to go on the underground, Central Line or Jubilee. There is no way in hell that I am going back to work and getting on the underground anytime soon. 
Um, you know, I will be working from home when I when I go back there in a month or so. Um, I have a vulnerable partner and my, my baby is vulnerable as well. He has a, a small hole in his heart, so he's slightly vulnerable there as well. I'm not going to take those chances. And I don't think anybody in your colleague's position um, or anyone else who's vulnerable, you know, if they're older, if they've got um, heart conditions or high blood pressure and all these kind of things that they've detailed or anybody that they're living with that's at high risk and has only just been allowed out today for the first time in 10 weeks, is it, Greg, I think, 10, 11 weeks, yep. something like that? You know, all of this needs to be taken into account because you don't want to make, you know, think about the anxiety that people would get if they were told they have to come back in. Some people are, are jumping at the bit, right? They just want to go back in. They don't care about the risk. Fine. Um, but there are so many people out there that will have mental health problems as a result of this. They will have, you know, nervous breakdowns at, at the thought of going back in and causing harm to perhaps their vulnerable families or, or children or whoever that they live with so every as much as we can do to make the office safe and treat everybody fairly and equally you also do need to consider every single person um, individual circumstances um, so I, I think it's absolutely fine I don't think you're being over cautious at all uh, and then one that we've got on the chat from Lauren and um, so your office is quite compact and people will have to walk behind desks and other people in order to go to meeting rooms and kitchens, what should be the protocol for this? I'm gonna hand that one over to you, Greg. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, what we're doing a lot of right now is rearranging desks. Um, absolutely, that's a problem. There's going to be pinch points in every office. So um, where there is a pinch point um, and it can't be avoided through rearranging, um, and let's face it, many of us have narrow off, narrow hallways and, and toilet routes and whatnot, um, putting a big sort of hazard symbol in the form of maybe uh, diagonal stripes or something on the floor um, and some notices. Um, we've also seen, for instance, queuing points. So if a, if a corridor is, is someone walking down it, make it a, make it a, a sort of, you know, in, in traffic, give way. Um, you have to give way to oncoming traffic. So stay here, wait till that traffic comes through and then go yourself. So I, I think this is a behavior question, right? In that we need to train our colleagues on how to use an office properly in this new world. And we haven't, something we haven't spoken about, but I'd love to hear your thought, thoughts, Hannah, is how, how we use our senior executives and, and role models and peer leaders within the office to model the behaviors that need to occur. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, for instance, all of us as, as office managers sitting down with the CEO and saying, look, you now need to model the behaviors that you've just signed off in this risk assessment. Therefore, here's the things that you absolutely normally do, which you must not do anymore. Right? It's, it's, it's you, people are going to look at you, and if you don't follow the new guidelines, no one else will, and you could have half the staff down with COVID-19. And let me tell you, I mean, there's not many stories out there of people catching it, but we had half of our staff immediately before the lock, lockdown, we had half of our staff working from home because they had COVID-19 symptoms. And let me tell you, that for a business is a complete nightmare. There is nothing you can do. They can't work, you can't work, the business can't operate. It's surprising how quickly COVID-19 can spread and the devastating impact it has with people with fevers and colds and flus and all sorts of symptoms. Um, and they are not knowing whether they actually they are infectious or not means everyone has to go home. Mm -hmm. So it's devastating to a workplace. So I think a, a, an earnest conversation between yourselves and the directors, um, senior executives, saying, hey, look, do we realise what happens if this goes wrong? The whole business stops, right? Because we have to send, once we get up, once we get two or three or, or an obvious infection occurring in the office, we're going to have to shut the whole office. And that's going to be devastating for a business that's trying to recover after we've been shut down for an extended period anyway. So let me tell you, as someone who's had half of their staff with the symptoms, it's, it's absolutely devastating in ways that you cannot imagine. Now, we were lucky in that the shutdown happened, the, pretty, the lockdown happened pretty much two days after we realised half our staff were in trouble. So we had the opportunity to furlough everyone to, in time to recover. But that's not something you'd wish on your worst enemy at a time when businesses are just trying to get back onto their feet. Yeah, I, I mean, I think with the executive piece, and making sure it's it's that ideal thing with health and safety rights. It's our ongoing battle. And I know CIS in particular on, on the call has this battle every day and bangs her head against a wall that they don't really take health and safety seriously. Hopefully now is our window of opportunity to get them to see how 
um, you know, having procedures and policies and risk assessments in place and then following and adhering to those is really important, not just in relation to infectious diseases and viruses and so on, but also in relation to everything that we do in the office. Um, I, my advice is once you've gone in, done your risk assessment, set out your policies, had them approved, done your staff return um, survey and all this kind of stuff that you can do prior to going back to prepare, you do a test run, you go into the office with your senior stakeholders. You say, right, we're doing this first and you literally manage up and say, this is what we're gonna do. And if some of them don't want to come back in, then fine, that's their decision. But if they're asking other people to come back in, why would they put those people in an environment that is untested in terms of your new layout, your new signage, your new sanitation points, your coffee machines, your stationary points being closed, all this other stuff that you've put in place, why would they not go and test it with you for a day, a week, a month, whatever it might be, just a small amount of people, five, ten people of you, and um, give feedback to you so you can make the modifications, you give feedback to them and so on, so that they are the experts that can manage from the top and give that um, you know, influential direction when people come back in because they're used to that environment, they're used to following the rules before anybody else is. I would personally have that conversation with them and say, I want you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. COO and Mr. CFO and CTO and so on and so forth and whatever O's you've got at the end of your titles there to come in with you and test it first. Right. Um, there's a good question there about air conditioning. Yeah. The thing, that, the thing that you need to know is what's called air exchange rate. So that's how they crank the machine so that you've got, and, and, and the figure is sort of two or three or something, air exchanges per hour is normal. Mm -hmm. So when you're speaking with your maintenance company, ask them to increase the number of air exchanges per hour. And that'll just keep flushing the air a little bit more and, and you'll it'll feel a little bit fresher. Um, but the weather at the moment is fine, so every system should be able to cope with this weather with more um, air exchanges. That shouldn't be a problem. Yeah, the HSE did confirm. It's on the portal as well, Shadia. I know you remember. So we put a tip up um, sometime last week because I saw a report from the HSE and they basically said that they encourage good ventilation to remove the risk of the, the spread of the coronavirus. So not just um, in terms of the heating and cooling element from your air conditioning system, but also the fresh air ventilation that comes from the same um, system or the same source and device. So um, yeah, do talk to your engineers, your maintenance providers, and see how it's running and um, make sure that you, you are increasing that if you're able to, so that actually not necessarily increasing the cooling so that everybody freezes, um, but increasing the fresh air and the flow rates of that so that you can get more pumping out um, than perhaps normal. Um, pleasure. Uh, let's have a look, have we covered yet? Yeah. Uh, so this has added a tip, risk assessment of building management needs to be done before you can come back into my off, into the office. My building is closed due to certain maintenance tasks not having been taken place while well, we're now dealing with the fallout. So yeah, it is really important to, to check with your building management that um, what they're doing because you are, we all know, you're at the mercy of them in normal times, let alone now. Um, so they, they are responsible for more footprint in the office in the sense of communal spaces with more traffic going in because it's not just your floor there's other tenants they have a, a much higher duty of care in that regard um, because of the amount of other people that will be going in you know will they be, be, be restricting numbers so if you've got capacity of 100 people per floor in your building or they'd be saying you can only um, go to 50% of, of that capacity. Um, so do have those conversations with them if you haven't already, because they might actually then derive the rules that you have to put in place because they're putting limits and restrictions and things on there as well. Right, I think we're up to date with questions and it's just gone four o'clock. So are there any more questions or comments or anything that anybody wants to share? Has anybody been back into their office and, and opened it up and seen how it's gone? want to share their story feel free to raise your hand if you do want to tell us about it i think there'll be some hilarious stories about what's in the fridge yeah. i found that when i went back into my office dead plants everywhere and and it, the only life in the office was growing in the fridge so that was <laughs> quite <Quick>, plant it <laughs> um okay i think we will wrap up there then if no one else has got any questions a few of you have asked um, whether this is being recorded it is um, 
So we'll upload it to YouTube and we'll upload it to the portal hopefully this evening and send the link and slides and everything round. Thank you so much, Greg. I think that's been really useful um, from you know another perspective to, to make sure that we're covering all angles here. We will do another one soon, everybody, so that we can keep in touch on this topic and continue to support you as much as possible. Keep an eye out on the portal as well because we'll keep adding our updates on there and hope everybody has a good week. Yeah, and don't be afraid to reach out. As I say, if you've got an office yeah. of over 20 people, um, we have a design team who can help out with ideas, redesigns, whatever you need. We're doing a lot of those at the moment. They're, they're easy to do once you know how. And we've been doing them for a little while now. So if you need any help, I'm Greg at Ripe Office with a Y, R-Y-P-E-O-F-F-I-C dot com. Um, love to hear from you. Thanks, Greg. Really appreciate it. Take care, everybody.